Association with MTN. This game is worldwide. This place is paradise. This is not the main We're in the British Virgin Islands. I spend time with one of the planet's most recognised faces who's made his home here. Sailing with Sir Richard Branson and going to his idyllic island, Necker. This is great. And actress Kate Winslet agreed to do something she's never tried before. Main Sail, next, only on CNN, in association with Rolex. Go beyond borders. Das ist CNN. My special guest, Larry Flint. Now, Larry, this book, One Nation Under Sex, is subtitled How the Private Lives of Presidents, First Ladies, and Their Lovers Changed the Course of American History. And you're probably the perfect guy to have written this book, but what have you unearthed? What have you found from your study of presidents' well, sex lives? Uh, first of all, when I decided I was going to do this book, I reached out for my friend David Eisenbach with Columbia University because he's a history professor. And I know what, nobody would want to read a history book written by a pornographer. <laughs> <laughs> so David's extremely bright and uh, quite familiar with the content. And we knew that presidencies were always affected by first ladies, mistresses, lovers, you know, and so we just went to work on it. Now, some of this stuff has been in print, very little of it, you know, I mean, most of it was unearthed by us. Who were the most shocking discoveries, would you say? Uh, well, uh, one thing that nobody knows, their youngest first lady was 19. She was Grover Cleveland's wife. She was actually the nanny, and while he was campaigning for president, his wife died, so he married the nanny and moved into the White House. Now, what does that mean, culturally speaking? Today, we would not accept an 18 or 19-year-old girl as first lady. I mean, uh, in America. Who, was, who was the most sexually promiscuous president, would you say? Uh, it turns up between Warren, Warren Harding and John Kennedy. I mean, the, the theory about John Kennedy is that had he not been assassinated, that within a, a year or two, so much stuff would have come out about his life that he would have been discredited. Do well, you go along with that? Uh, that's probably true. See, I grew up during the period of the Kennedy mystique. And it's that time when everybody loved their country, everybody was patriotic, everybody felt you could accomplish whatever you wanted to. And, 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 and Kennedy was a feel-good president. And uh, so when his pension was for the Hollywood starlets like Marilyn, Angie Dickinson, and uh, Candy Berg and Marlena Dietrich, Marlena Dietrich, you know, people like this. So uh, and his wife, even while he was alive, before he died, she started having affairs, too. So these affairs were very careless and reckless. I always and find it odd that someone like you can have built a, a, you know, a billion dollar empire out of pretty hardcore sex in a country that can be so puritanical about the sex lives of politicians. I mean, if you look at someone like Bill Clinton, for example, he's one of the most popular presidents ever. And yet he was a pretty naughty boy, wasn't he? Yeah, but see... Where's the consistency of this puritanical... Clinton's unique, Clinton is, as well. Clinton is what you refer to as the lovable rogue. Mm. Even from the time Jennifer Flowers first came out with her accusations, uh, everybody knew it was true. And in the end, during his trial in the Senate, he did lie about, you know, having sex with that girl and what have you, but... But Clinton always wore it on his sleeve. He didn't hide it like many of the conservative Republicans do. So the nation was able to forgive him. Are you still investigating the sex lives of Republicans? Every year we run an ad in the Washington Post that costs $85,000 to try to get as much dirt as we can on them because that's the only way I can affect politics. Otherwise, all I got is one vote. You know, but but, but what, I, what makes you so confident that the Republicans that you're going to be exposing are any better or worse than their Democratic rivals? Well, well we will expose anybody with a Democratic Republican. We're an e equal opportunity offender. But, yeah, but Larry, how can you 
honestly, if I'm playing devil's advocate, how can you have the gall to expose other people for their sex lives, given I'm the way you built your business? I'm not exposing their sex life. It's the hypocrisy. Like when I exposed this Speaker of the House, uh, Livingston, during the Clinton, Clinton impeachment, when he was wanting Clinton's uh, head on a platter, and he's uh, seeing uh, uh, three women uh, enter in his office, uh, a, a, a federal judge, and also a, a lobbyist on Capitol Hill, and he, you know he was dying, denying all of this. So when we busted him. He did an interview with me. Does it have to be hypocritical yeah. in your view? It has yeah. to be made hypocritical. Have to, have to, well, uh, when he was doing an interview with the New York Times, they asked him what he thought about me, and he says, I think Larry Flynn is a bottom feeder. So they called me for a comment, and I said, yeah, that's right, but look what I found when I got down there. <laughs> so that's what we do. We try to get down in the mud with them and let people know that they're human. Uh, have, you, have you got any big scandals that you've got up your sleeve for the next election campaign? We're constantly working uh, at least a half a dozen or so investigations in both the Senate and the House. You never know what's going to materialize, you know, but we always hope something will. But they'd all be Republicans, though, would they? Uh, I, most of them are Republican, and it's only because they make it easy for us, you know. They got so much baggage. You know, that, that guy we got in Louisiana, Venter, he's in the Senate. He's the abstinence guy. That's what he was promoting. But he was seeing hookers in both Washington, D.C. and Well, well for, example, for, for argument's sake, if you've got a story about President Obama, a, a sex scandal about him, would you feel it was right to publish that, given the obvious damage that would do to the, the country and its reputation? I wouldn't want to, but I would. You would? It would be very hypocritical of me not to. Finally, one of the most fascinating things about you, Larry, is that you were nearly assassinated yourself. No one's ever been quite sure who by. I know there's a name that was put in the frame, and you're pretty certain it was that person, yeah. but never brought to justice over it. It left you uh, partially paralyzed. Yeah. Um, what do you feel when you look back on what happened to you that day? I don't look what, what, do you, what do you feel about it? you feel bitter look, about it? I don't look at it as who shot me, but rather what shot me. It's the mentality of a person that wants to shoot you because they disagree with what you're doing or they disagree with your politics. Uh, uh, this guy was a racist, a uh, white racist, who was upset over a black and white photo feature we had ran in the magazine. And that's really why he shot me. It was an interracial photo shoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how's it affected your life? Obviously, physically it has, but has it affected well, you in your spirit, do you think? People always ask me, what's it like being in a wheelchair? Yeah. I don't, you know, if you hadn't mentioned it, I wouldn't even thought about it. Really? I don't spend my life dwelling on anything I can't do nothing about. So I don't never think about I'm in a wheelchair until somebody mentions it. How would you like to be remembered? As someone who fought to expand the parameters of free speech in a very good way. Well, that's a pretty laudable way to be remembered, I'd say. Larry Flint, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up, a true life story of childhood trauma and shocking violence. How one woman says she found freedom behind bars. Up to the minute with CNN's Hala Karani. When we know it, you'll know it. International Desk, tonight, only on CNN. The sailors worldwide, this place is paradise. This is not the main sail, we're in the British Virgin Islands. I spend time with one of the planet's most recognised faces who's made his home here. Sailing with Sir Richard Branson and going to his idyllic island, Necker.